Welcome back to Council Candidates Live Round 2. I'm Sandy Jacobson. This segment is one of four which gives a group of the candidates for City Council a chance to answer a wide range of questions asked on video by community leaders. The League of Women Voters of Santa Monica Education Fund has randomly divided candidates into small groups so they can both answer the questions and interact with their fellow candidates in a roundtable forum. The candidates have signed a speaker's agreement confirming that they agree to program guidelines and ground rules, which include maintaining an atmosphere of respect and tolerance throughout the forum, and an understanding that standards of civility and courtesy will be enforced by the moderator. I'd like to introduce the candidates for our final segment of Council Candidates Live Round 2. We'll be talking with City Council candidates Pam O'Connor, Frank Gruber, Michael Feinstein, and Jerry Rubin. We'll start with 45-second opening statements from each candidate, starting with Jerry Rubin. Well, I want to really thank City TV and the League of Women Voters for doing this throughout the whole election season. You in particular. I want to thank Robin. I want to thank Ken at City TV. I'd like to thank the uh, makeup artists, <laughs> personally. They did a really good job, Judith and Danielle. And they got a great uh, student intern here, Nairi. So I'm giving a shout out to all of you. We have a great city. I said this last week in my opening statement, and I'm sticking by it again. And I'm sure I will in the future. My wife, Marissa, and I love Santa Monica, and it's a positive city. Thank you, Jerry. Michael Feinstein, please. Hi, I'm Michael Feinstein. I'm a 30-year Santa Monica resident and renter. As a former mayor and council member here in Santa Monica, I have a long record of being a positive, creative, big picture, and solutions-oriented office holder. I'm an environmentalist, a parks and open space champion, and both as an activist and as an office holder, I've opposed inappropriate development in our community, including leading the way to prevent a regional traffic generating office tower in our civic center and creating beautiful Tongva Park instead. My philosophy of governing is to listen and learn from everyone and I believe in governing for the entire community. I ask for your vote. Thanks very much. Frank Gruber, please. Hi, uh, I'm Frank Gruber. I also want to thank the League and City TV. Uh, I moved to Santa Monica to, into Ocean Park in 1983 and uh, it's been more than 20 years that I've been very active in uh, Santa Monica affairs. Um, I was on the Housing Commission and the Planning Commission, and for more than 10 years, I wrote a weekly watchdog column about Santa Monica. I went to hundreds of meetings. Uh, I got to know the city very well and what its needs are, and I, I'm running to try to keep going the great progressive tradition that we have in Santa Monica. I've been endorsed by the education community, Community for Excellent Public Schools, by the police and firefighters, and because of my environmental record, by the Los Angeles League of Conservation Voters. I hope to have your vote on November 4th. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pam O'Connor, please. Hi, I'm Pam O'Connor, and I agree with Jerry and all. We have a great city that I'm running because I'm committed to a sustainable future for our exceptional city. I've been endorsed by trusted community leaders, by Assemblymember Richard Bloom, by our County Supervisor Jeff Zabiroslavsky, by our Police and Fire Association, by Community for Excellent Public Schools, and by environmental groups like the Los Angeles League of Conservation Voters. And I've been working hard to bring a transportation renaissance to our city, and Expo Light Rail is going to open in Santa Monica in just under two years. I'm looking forward to continuing to work for those kinds of solutions to make sure that our city is a safe place, a place where our children will be well-educated, where our children will thrive, and where we will have an intergenerational city living together. Thank you very much, Jerry, Michael, Frank, and Pam. The League asked community leaders to, ex to come in and tape questions for our candidates. Here's our first question, and it concerns measures H and HH. Hi, my name is Gina DeVaca. I'm the co-chair of the Pico Neighborhood Association. And my question is, if H and HH pass, would you prioritize Santa Monica residents in having access to the affordable housing that gets built? Affordable housing for extremely low-income residents in Santa Monica is virtually non-existent. If H and HH pass, would you vote to prioritize the increase in the affordable housing stock for extremely low-income residents using the area medium 
income of LA County as a guide? Would you prioritize housing for local residents and their families? Thank you very much. Michael, how would you respond to that? Well, when if H&H &H passes, what that does is it allows us, because we would be generating all of the funds to specifically dedicate affordable housing that we create to the people that Gina is talking about. When it's state or federal funds, then we can't dedicate it only to local people. So H and HH would actually give us that sort of control, and I support that goal wholeheartedly so that people who have trouble affording to stay in the community can do so. Thank you. Uh, Jerry Rubin, please. Well, I join with the uh, Santa Monica Democratic Club and so many other groups and individuals that are supporting uh, H and HH. And uh, I think it's important people know that we're talking about a transfer tax at the point of sale for residences that are over a million dollars. So I guess when you really think about it, if uh, Sarah Palin were a resident here or Ted Cruz of the Tea Party, they might oppose this, but I'm urging everyone here in Santa Monica to support it. Thank you. Pam O'Connor, please. I support H and HH, Measure HH, and as noted, this is local funds, so that would allow us to dedicate those funds to housing for local residents. That being said, though, we do have an affordable housing crisis that's here in Santa Monica and here in the region, and that's why it's extremely important for us to support affordable housing and the construction of more affordable housing in Santa Monica. And again, especially aimed at our own residents, those folks who are, and folks who are working here, folks who are, and children who are growing up, although we hope they'll have strong futures. Thank you, Pam. Frank, please. Yeah, I want to join with uh, uh, the other candidates up here. I think we all agree with that. I want to emphasize what's been said about that this is local money and that we get to use it uh, to prioritize whoever we want. And the questioner a couple times used the word extremely low income, and I think that was something that meant something to her. And that's very important to think about because I think what she's getting at there are the people who we otherwise see as homeless, the, the people who are have no income whatsoever, they're disabled, or whatever pro pro problems they have. And again, this money that the city controls, the city can use that for different groups like OPCC and Upward Bound and various groups like that to do that. All right, so obviously we're not going to get it, we're not gonna mm -hmm. mix it up about who supports and who doesn't support H and HH. Michael. Well, I, I would just add one thing. Our governor, Jerry Brown, took away the redevelopment agency funds that we were using to build a lot of affordable housing. And when he did so, he did say that he would backfill eventually some of that money so that cities could perform their affordable housing obligations. He hasn't done so yet, and I think our future city council in the next term, when our governor is most likely to be reelected, we're gonna have to be lobbying him to keep that promise because Santa Monica residents can't fund it by ourselves. But in effect, if it comes from Jerry, if it comes from the state, then it doesn't necessarily apply strictly, exclusively to Santa Monica residents. That's what you've all well, said. Right, that's true. But what's so interesting there is that what we also want to do, is, in addition to funding the people that Gina DeBacca was talking about, we also have our police, fire, and public education personnel who don't live in the city, but we want to be able to provide some housing for them to be able, especially uh, for the teachers who can't necessarily afford the market rate housing and thus if we can build some housing at that level and then dedicate so they have the first opportunity to move into those units that can work for us. So what Michael's talking about there too is there's a range of affordability. There's a very low that Frank noted for the people who might be homeless, the people who are seniors, the most vulnerable of our population. There's also other levels of affordable housing including moderate levels of affordability. And those are the people who are working in Santa Monica at jobs like librarians, the police, and fire. So mm -hmm. having that ability to serve the most vulnerable and also to build a strong middle class is important. One thing we should also note is that historically most of the money generated this way in the city, I think it's at least 60 percent, has been used for rehab in Santa Monica. Ah, that was gonna so ask so it, that. it really is, uh, strengthens our neighborhoods in many ways. You have a building that is in not great shape, the landlord's not that interested in whatever. Uh, community corporation can, can buy the building, keep the existing rent controlled tenants in there, and then upgrade the building and make it available to people of limited means. So it wouldn't necessarily imply there'd be more development? Not oh, necessarily, no. no. And when people who work in the city can live in the city, we cut down traffic. Yes. 
But Sandy, I just want to address that. We graduate 500 students every year from our high school. So where are we going to put them? Some of, not all of them will come back, but some of them will. So that will grow our community. So we do have to look for what is the right amount for us to grow. Because we will and probably should grow, but where are those strategic locations for that? And how can we help the people who are living here, working here and contributing here? If, yeah, if no, I, I, let's I, give Jerry a chance. Yeah, I agree with uh, everybody and what Mayor O'Connor just said. Uh, you know, things are going to change. We have to understand that. There's going to be an ongoing need for affordable and low-income housing and workforce housing. Prop H and H, HH, are crucial to support that. You might hear some opposition to it, but it's very important to support that. But there's other things the city uh, is doing as well. That, well, I'm not going to hear any opposition to that no. at this table. No. All right, we've heard the candidates answer our first question about Measure H and HH. So now it's your chance to tell us what you think about this idea. To participate, text your answer to 22333. Text the answer that you see in the parentheses on the screen. Or the easiest way to vote is to go to pollev.com slash citytv. You'll see each poll when it's open and just click to send in your vote. So tell us your answer. How do you feel about affordable housing for low income residents in Santa Monica being virtually non-existent? If H and HH pass, would you vote to prioritize the increase in the affordable housing stock for extremely low income residents using the area medium income or of LA County as a guide? Would you prioritize housing, housing for local residents and their families? Yes, vote yes, SM2. No, no, SM2. Only to, extend, uh, to the extent allowed by the funding support, that's extent SM, and you don't know, DKSM2. We'll be back with the results before the end of this segment to see how your answers compare with the answers of the candidates. Now on to our next question, which has to do with public transit. I'm Zena Josephs, president of Friends of Sunset Park. What do you envision as a necessary and viable public transportation system within Santa Monica that will provide a real alternative to private automobiles and one that will allow seniors and the disabled to actively participate in the full range of options for inclusion in the life of our city? Pam, will you? answer that first please. Sure. There, we have the big blue bus and the big blue bus will continue to be kind of the backbone of service in Santa Monica and as long as people are mobile can use that it, it is there. But in addition to that there are other kinds of services such as on-demand services and the on-demand now the dial right kinds of services you schedule ahead of time. But now that we have information technology, um, global positioning, we're going to be able to have a system I think in the future where the on-demand can be driven by people's immediate needs so that folks can say no matter what your age I want to go from here to there and the circulator can be routed that way. Thank you. Michael please. Well one of the things that I would work on in a new council term is to get a new transit corridor a new sort of wrong, wrong camera there to get a new line going down Lincoln Boulevard. It's great that we're getting the Expo line. Uh, Mike Bonin, the council member in LA has endorsed me with the idea of working on regional transit solutions and we're going to have to have something that connects along Lincoln to Expo and goes all the way to the South Bay. Thank you very much. Um, Frank Gruber please. Yeah, I, I like to uh, build a little bit on what Pam said, which is that I think that we really can work on our dial a ride type thing uh, for the seniors and disabled people a lot more. Right now, my dad uh, lives in Santa Monica, and he can't use it to go even slightly outside of Santa Monica to visit his friends, like he has a very good friend in Brentwood, he can't visit her there. Uh, but more, a, a bigger issue I think is connecting us regionally and connecting commuters coming into Santa Monica with what I call a point-to-point -point bus system, express buses that get off of the grid. Thank you. Jerry Rubin, please. Well, I said this so many times, I never had a car in my life. I never even had a driver's license. I know a car is a necessity. But people need to think of ways to get out of their car at least 10, 15 percent of the time. Here's my 30-day blue bus pass. I'll pay the first fare for anybody that hasn't rid, rid, uh, ridden on the blue bus yet. 
It's wonderful. It's the best bus company in America. It's only $24 a month. Go anywhere. We're doing great things for bicycles okay. and, every, and the light rails come in. We have every opportunity. Thank you very much, Jerry. Um, so that's all of you. So, okay, so you all agree. We need buses. Um, and what you're talking about, I wasn't exactly clear on. So in other words, you can call up for, to get a ride specifically well, right, like right a cab, but it won't go out of Santa Monica? Right. Well, not necessarily. I, I'm saying right now a circulator goes a specific route. You, know, you have a circulator bus goes a specific route. But with GPS technology, with smartphones, et cetera, that emerging technologies uh, on demand services are more happening more and more. You have it coming through the mm -hmm. private car like Lyft and Uber. Uber right. right. That can be, why can't that be applied to a transit service? Uh, whether it's operated by a private sector or op operated by the public sector. It can move people around more efficiently than, say, a single car. So those are the kinds of things we need to be open for. And then you have the, the other aspect of it you're talking about is what is that what does the area serve? And we are a region, and I do believe, and as Frank noted with his father, most of us live lives where it takes us out of Santa Monica some of the time. So that regional cooperation, working with Los Angeles Department of Transportation, working with LA County Metro and the municipal operators, we need to get better at serving people and making sure we can get them from point to point. Uh, there's access services currently in Los Angeles County. That's for the most folks who are most disabled. But there's the, that segment of people who are in between um, being totally able to move around and being uh, so disabled that they need special services and as our we have an aging population we need to look at other ways to allow access get access to people who need it you're nodding Michael she's Michael. right and and we're going to evolve you know had we only been able to keep the red car you know all those years ago we <laughs> would have evolved the way a lot of the great european cities did and now that we're going to get the expo line we're going to evolve around that and the kind of technologies that our mayor is talking about are going to develop around that and give us the flexibility to relate from different areas to get onto that line and to other destinations but, uh, you know i think it's great that we have mayor o'connor on the metro board and she's been doing a she's been doing a great job and it's great that the light rail is going to allow an abundance of bicycles to be put on them. So I'm really looking forward to when the light rail comes here. We have so many opportunities to get out of our car. We should take advantage of them. It's a matter of personal responsibility. Frank? Well, a couple days ago, I mean, I agree with everything that's been said, but it, uh, the rail lines aren't going to do everything. And the, and the buses on the grid moving slowly across the grid aren't going to do everything either. A couple days ago, the LA Times uh, had an article about high-tech companies in Glendale running their own shuttle services uh, like they do up in the Bay Area to bring high-tech wor workers from the west side to Glendale. Uh, so they avoid the traffic, they work on, they have Wi-Fi, they work on their computers on the way. W what I don't see is why the big blue bus can't do something like that. We have job centers around Bergamont, we have around the hospitals, around downtown. We know where those workers live. <laughs> and we can get bus and shuttle service out to those places, bring them directly here, crossing the grid, using the HOV lanes on the 405. So it's a little bit like what they do in San Francisco. Yes, Are you talking about what they're doing in San Francisco? It's inspired by that, yeah. But they're the, it's private companies. Yeah, I was going like to say. Google it's has its own campus. They Microsoft. send their own buses out right. there. We don't have one big company like Google. We have a lot of companies, but they're clustered together. It's a perfect opportunity for the big blue bus to come into a new area of service. Michael. And then uh, a lot of this has to do from the supply side, and I would just add that from the demand side, we have to always emphasize when we have developing agreements into having local hiring where it's possible and to meet local needs locally with the type of development that we have to reduce the need to commute in the first place. And I would add that LA County Metro has a program, has a van pool program that, <coughs> that functions somewhat, as you note, that people who live in a certain area can get together and have a shared van that also is uh, underwritten a bit, some of, the, some of the, the cost of that, to take them to a single point of employment. So that has already been deployed at the county. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do more of that mm -hmm. and find out more and have more operators. Good. V very interesting ideas. Uh, we're doing live audience polling tonight, and we're asking you to participate with your vote on the question you see on the screen. Text your answer to 22333. 
send the answer that you see in the parentheses. Or go to pollev.com slash citytv to vote online. Join in and email or text us now. So let's move on to our next question, which has to do with child care. Hi, I'm Shante Bernard with Connections for Children. Quality child care and early education is the largest monthly cost for families after housing. What can the city do to provide greater access to early childhood programs for the residents and those who work in Santa Monica? Frank, will you lead us off, please? Well, I think the city has, is developing a, a great program, a Cradle to Career, uh, and in that, I, I think that the city can expand these programs. But uh, the question hits at the core of the city's um, commitment to education. Uh, on one side, part of it, one side of our commitment is that we give money uh, to the school district, which our uh, residents have, you know, insisted on that through Community for Excellent Public Schools. The other point is the city can do a lot more to make children ready to enter school. Thank you. Pam, please. Uh, this week, the Secretary of Education, Ernie Duncan, was in the Los Angeles area, and Santa Monica was asked to participate in the round table. I was happy to be there and to talk about our early education efforts for children. And I want to point out that the well-being project that the uh, city received a million dollars for to develop a well-being index, that came out of the early childhood education youth re report card that was evaluating the status of youth in Santa Monica. They found out that we were surprised to find out that more of our kindergartners were not ready for kindergarten than we expected. That then tells us we can invest more and we need to put more money into that. So I want to talk about more uh, that more when we get to our round table. Jerry, please. Well, um, it's so important. I mean, it's mandated in any development agreement to go to have a lot of money given to uh, child care arts, affordable housing, numerous things. So I hope people understand that, that when we have development, there's things that are benefited, things that we need in the community that we'd be very sad if we were to lose them. And this is one of the most important things. Michael, please. During my time on the council, I was a strong supporter of funding for child care and while now we've got to a place where there are a lot of spots for y young children, the issue that we face now is that the affordability of the existing spots aren't so great, and we need to be looking to support so that everybody can afford childcare. So are we talking about uh, pre, we're talking about pre-K, right? We're talking about child care from about what age to what age would you, would you say? Obviously, the outer limit's five or six when they enter kindergarten. But how early do you, should we sh start, do you think? Well, one of the things that um, Santa Monica and it, it does in partnership with schools and with other agency providers are parenting information. Because just talking to your child at an early age, Reading. reading to your child, using words, all of that helps with development. So the kinds of things, because everybody, when you're a new parent, it's suddenly new to you. So what are those kinds of things? What are the parenting skills? And then where are the resources available um, to folks to get access to those services? Uh, we have are working in conjunction with Santa Monica College and working in conjunction with the schools. And this is a partnership, too. I mean, the thing here is it's a partnership and collaboration of the institutions working together, the nonprofit organizations, and coordinating the kinds of services and making sure people know how to get to them. Michael. You know, Pam is right. You can never start too early. I was really fortunate that my mother read to me every night before I went to sleep when I was really young. And I was reading at two and a half as a result of that. But there's a lot of families that can't dedicate that kind of time. And I think as a community, if we can support that, all the better. I'm going to extend this a little bit. Shante's question uh, talked specifically about affordability. And I don't think you can quite separate this question uh, from living wages and the amount of money uh, people are making. You have a situation where you have both parents in a family or single family um, households where the, the, the parent is working and commuting for long times and not making very much money and uh, relying on very informal networks uh, for child care. We need to create the access to formal networks, but we also need to increase the uh, amount of money that people make, and uh, that will have a ripple effect 
uh, uh, through our society. And uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I know there's going to be a nice new uh, child care center in our beautiful yes. Civic Center right near the uh, Civic Auditorium that we're trying to save as well. And I think that's really crucial. Uh, one quote by uh, Gandhi, he said, if we ever want to have peace on our planet, we have to begin with the children. And I always remember that. That's mm -hmm. why I'm glad that Santa Monica does so much to help the youth. Uh, one thing. In our region, Southern California Association of Governments has identified that in our six-county region, 25% of the children live in poverty. We're lucky in affluent Santa Monica, we're fairly affluent, so it's some lower percentage. But still, it's something like six or 10% of the children in Santa Monica live in poverty, to Frank's point. So how to help families move out of poverty, how to make sure they are making a living wage, what are the kinds of things that we as a community of Santa Monica and region can do to help lift all boats, that will help children, yeah. that will feed children, that will get them ready to learn. And then from a true cost, a perspective, a small amount spent for young people compared to the negative social cost later on when people's lives don't go as well. So right. we invest in ourselves early on makes total sense. And, and it's also the positive. If you, if kids are better educated, they earn more money, they'll pay our social security. <laughs> That's right. Have you weighed in yet with your vote on our live audience poll? We're doing live text polling tonight as part of our program and inviting you to tell us your opinion on questions we're asking the candidates. If you want to vote via text, send us the info in the parentheses to 22333 or vote online at pollev.com slash citytv. Well, let's see who's up next for our last question for the candidates. I'm Lawrence Eubank, chair of the Wilshire, Montana Neighborhood Coalition. What is your vision for Wilshire Boulevard, and does it include activity centers, increased height and density anywhere along Wilshire? Okay, Jerry. Well, I, I actually think the activity centers which were discussed at length in the loose plan are not a bad idea if they're worked out appropriately. Uh, and I think the city staff and uh, everyone are, uh, are doing that. I think the uh, Miramar Hotel being a little bit taller and having more union jobs, double or triple the open space, more parking and millions of dollars in community benefits is worth it for the city with a great architect working on the design as well. So I support that. Thank you. Frank, please. Well, I don't have any specific formula about it. Um, I do think that the vision in the loose was basically good, that we should not be developing more jobs along Wilshire Boulevard. We should be developing more housing. That should not be uh, particularly tall housing. It's housing that fits the, the uh, uh, the, the kind of boulevard that we that we have there and that we want to have. Um, the, as for the activity centers, I think that people, there's kind of a knee-jerk reaction against them because they just sound like one of these planner jargon type okay. things. But if they're right. planned right, I think they could be fine. Okay. Michael, please. Well, my understanding of the activity centers was the idea of significantly increased density at a couple of key intersections, but that was premised upon the idea of the subway coming here and that they would be public transit oriented. The subway is not coming to Wilshire Boulevard for decades and I don't think we should be talking about any changes until we know that's coming. For now, I don't think we should have the activity centers as, as conceived. Thank you. Pam, please. Well, there's the activity center and planner jargon, what's in the loose, and then there's the reality of Wilshire Boulevard. And there are activity centers there right now. I think of one at 14th and, and Wilshire, where you have a market, you have, you know, and nearby, two blocks away, you have a new donut shop, but you also have, you have restaurants and that have legacy restaurants in that area. So I think it has to do with how does the boulevard, how does it change over time? How do we keep it a vital boulevard, a place because it connects neighbors Neighborhoods, both in terms of its transportation but as well as services. So how to make sure that it has those neighborhood kinds of services. Thank you. One of the things that always, that, that surprised me, I watched that the Santa Monica UCLA hospital go up and I thought, oh, there goes the neighborhood. That you wouldn't be able to move around in there. And it didn't work out that way. No. It's, it's pretty open. Uh, for Santa Monica, I mean, we have a lot of traffic in many parts of the city, but that part didn't get any any worse for the, for well, what, Michael? You're disagreeing yeah, with well, me. Well, okay, so 
when I walk precincts, when I walk during this campaign, one of the things, unfortunately, that we're hearing is a lot of people who work in that hospital aren't parking on site. Um, and paying for parking on site, they are going ahead and parking in the residential neighborhoods north on Wilshire uh, and making it harder for the residents to park there. So unfortunately, that piece didn't work mm -hmm. out too well. Well, I think that you can deal with that. You should be able to deal with it with preferential parking, the right kind of preferential parking. Uh, there are a lot of parking strategies to get people into the parking lots where they're supposed to be. But uh, the main thing is that um, uh, Wilshire Boulevard has a lot of character to it in a lot of places. I mean, I love the whole stretch from, from Santa Monica Seafood and 10th Street up to about Tehran Market, where you have a huge, just a terrific collection of, of, of specialty food stores. And you never want to lose that. But by the same token, um, you don't want to put your, we're going to have housing development. We, we as we're talking about the 500 students uh, graduating each year. Uh, we have uh, horrible jobs, uh, housing imbalance, which causes all this commuter traffic in. So we're going to build housing. We don't want to put it into our neighborhoods. We want, our neighborhoods are pretty good just the, the way they are. And so the natural place to put them are on these boulevards with along the transit quarters to have people who can then work at the hospital and walk to work. There's a lot of things you can do there, but the important thing is to keep that character that, it, that makes the boulevards integrated into their neighborhoods. I see you. No. Uh, I think we need to keep the uh, character. Uh, I um, just want to say, I know Mike said the subways might not be here. Uh, that's sad. I hope, wish it would. But it's still a really traveled transit corridor. The uh, metro buses run down there in their lane every five minutes, all day, every day. So I think that is an appropriate place to have some reasonable community-supported uh, development. And the activity center or opportunity sites is a good idea by the city. And just briefly about the subway. The subway has been funded with a full funding grant agreement from the federal government and also some TIFIA money that's a <coughs> loan money from the federal government. And, and it is from continuing on from Wilshire Western going to Westwood and the VA. The reason why that funding, the project is ending there in terms of the funding is that's where the highest ridership is. The ridership went down as it goes into Santa Monica because frankly our densities along Wilshire Boulevard are not subway densities. But that being said, we are a destination, and once the subway gets to Westwood and gets to the VA, the logical extension, in spite of the densities along Wilshire Boulevard, is to take it to the beach. The subway um, groundbreaking for this next phase is going to be November 7th. We get that going, and then it's up to us in Santa Monica to say, next steps once it gets to Westwood and the VA is take it all the way to Santa Monica. Michael. Just a, a small uh, response on, on the point about preferential parking can deal with the hospital. When I was on the council, I voted for a lot, lot of the preferential zones north of Wilshire, but they only went a couple blocks north of Wilshire, and that was to try and deal with the fact that a lot of the small businesses don't have enough parking. We didn't want to force them to redevelop and go too big, so we, we, we tried to compromise for the neighbors and the small businesses. What the hospital has done is forced people to go north of the preferential zones into areas where we didn't previously have it. And that's, that's the problem that, that, that's happened. So it's going to be like Samaka College where we have to keep extending the zones further and further and further. Although when Expo comes in, um, there will be as a reasonable walk, reasonable bike ride and with bike share and could be shuttles to take people from Expo who are, Agreed, are, are so. working at the hospitals to both hospitals. Mm -hmm. so when we, I'm sorry, Frank. Hope so. Go uh, ahead. I just yeah. want to respond a little bit to what Pam about the subway. Um, and maybe this is two uh, decades away I, from I it. I just need, okay. is Subway Expo? I no, was saying, no, okay. there's a Wilshire subway, the purple line, okay. that now goes to Western. It's going to be extended to Westwood. Okay. Uh, and uh, the, the thing is, all subway routes, all rail routes, when they get to the end of the line, they thin out. They have fewer riders. That's right. part of the thing. Santa Monica is actually the best end of a line that you mm -hmm. can possibly right. imagine because we are a destination, we have jobs, and we have people right. going to jobs. So if Metro... Ten years from now, isn't okay. building the subway out here? We got a complaint. Okay. So the light rail goes from downtown Los Angeles along Exposition Boulevard into Santa Monica. That is light rail above ground. The subway is a heavier rail. It goes now from downtown Los Angeles down Wilshire Boulevard to Wilshire Western. Will be extended westward to Westwood to the VA. And, and as Frank said, we hope we get it all the way to Santa Monica, the great destination for the subway to the sea. And I hope it's in my lifetime. Yeah, yeah. let's <laughs> yeah. 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 I think everybody on this day will hope that. Thank you. I'd like to thank. 
thank Pam O'Connor, Frank Gruber, Michael Feinstein, and Jerry Rubin for joining us tonight. So now let's take a look at our audience poll results. You heard Pam, Frank, Michael, and Jerry talk about Measure H and HH. What did our audience think? Well, it looks like our audience went big time for yes on SM, which means yes on H and HH, 57%, and only 29% went uh, no on SM. And there's that 14% who still hasn't made up their mind. <laughs> well, on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Santa Monica, Education Fund, and City TV, we wish to thank all the candidates in all the groups. And thank you to the community leaders for their participation in tonight's shows. If you've missed and turned in late and missed any of the segments, you can watch it again on City TV Channel 16 and smvote.org. And as always, we thank you, our viewers, for being so involved in our city. Remember to vote by mail or go to the polls on November 4th. Remember, elections are won by those who vote. For all of us at the League and City TV, good night.